<clears throat> Let me now introduce uh, Pat Waters uh, from LinkedIn. Uh, so Pat, she doesn't know this, but I've often told others um, she's becoming the rock star CHRO in the United States. Uh, she's, she seems to be everywhere. She brought her own little fan club too, as you can see. So <laughs> Pat, um, Pat is just a remarkable woman and, um, and doing remarkable things. And she's going to tell you how she's making HR sexy. Uh, but let me give you a little bit of background on Pat. She joined LinkedIn in January of 2013, and she leads the world-class talent team, uh, otherwise known as HR. So in addition to hiring, retaining, and, and inspiring top talent, Pat is also responsible for all employee-related HR programs at LinkedIn, including Comp and Ben and Performance Management. Now, she came there from Plantronics, where she was the SVP of HR, and then prior to that, she was at Yahoo, which is where she met uh, LinkedIn's current CEO, uh, and he, uh, he brought, her, uh, brought her to LinkedIn. Uh, she's doing some remarkable things there. Um, I've continually been impressed with what LinkedIn as an organization is doing. My mind kind of just gets boggled by all the possibilities <laughs> uh, for LinkedIn, and I'm sure uh, for many of the people that work there, it does as well. Uh, but I'll let Pat come up and tell you how she's making HR sexy. Let's have a round of applause for Pat Waters. They told me they'd surprise me on the music. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so good morning, everybody. How are you? Great. Thank you. I like energy in the morning. So um, making HR sexy is really um, something I do every day. I think HR, what we do is an amazing craft. I just want to spend one moment before I go into the presentation and tell you why I think it's so freaking cool. When I decided to go into HR through a series of conversations when I was in college, I took one of those career center tests and said, what do you want to be when you grow up? And it said social worker, teacher, I'm going to date myself, personnel at the time, and said, you know, service, people, helping people, what do you think? And I said, that's funny, my dad's a personnel director at GM. My uncle is the vice president of industrial relations at McGregor Corporation, so I'll interview them. And so for about, I don't know, a week, I talked to my dad, I talked to my uncle, talked to some folks that worked at GM, and asked them, what is this thing called personnel and HR? The most defining conversation I had happened to be with my uncle. And he said, honey, it's a really, really important job. And he goes, you may not know it, but it's responsible for 70% of a company's operating expenses on average. And I go, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, think about it. Talent is the thing that fuels most companies. If you're a service organization, it's about 98%, 99% of their costs. If it's a capitally intense company, it's much lower than 70, 80%. On average, it's about 80%. LinkedIn today is 79%. That still holds true today. And so I go, what makes this cost a big deal, Uncle Roland? And he said, well, honey, here's the deal. If you overpay, you won't be as profitable as you deserve to be. If you underpay, you'll have turnover and disheartened employees. They feel that they're treated unfairly. They may leave, be less productive, less engaged. That's also an impact on your P&L. They may not achieve the sales quota. And they not, may not be as innovative as you want them to be. So how you treat your employees, how you pay your employees, the benefits you provide them, the stickiness in which you envelop them in any organization is the magic. Our job in HR is to create that magic every day. I said, done. I'm going to be in HR. And I said I was going to run HR, because that's where you get to play with all the levers. I was 18 at the time. I didn't know what running HR meant. Now I do. It's pretty freaking cool. So now let's talk about innovation in HR. I happen to work with a very cool company, LinkedIn. Have the privilege of working with the executive team that allows me to take risks. An amazing talent platform, which I get to geek out on data. And every day I learn. And so I'm going to tell you a couple of stories about what we've experienced recently in LinkedIn and maybe stimulate some of your creative thinking. So we're going to bring sexy back to HR. <laughs> That's not my real name, just in case you're worried. Um, but I have found out through interviewing interns, new college grads, you know, the rising millennials, very few people understand what we do. And when I talk to people and I try to recruit Interns, I specifically went after engineering interns two summers ago to have them spend time in HR. 
And they're like, ah, I'm not so sure. One came from Stanford. He actually went to his professor and said, should I spend a summer in HR? And the professor said, yeah, it'd be great for you to have people skills, so go in there. So, <laughs> so off he went. This intern now has come back again and again and wants to work full time in HR. Why? Because the algorithm, the complexity of our system of human beings is more appealing to him than designing an app. He found magic. So at LinkedIn, my vision is to transform the world of talent. Everything that I do and my team does is, is meant to be transparent to the world. We share it with our customers. We share it with our employees. I want to raise the conversation because if I learn what you're doing in the oil industry or in the financial industry or what you're doing in Singapore versus Malaysia versus Russia, there might be a gold nugget in there that can transform the world of talent that we can all leverage. The borders are becoming more permeable. Technology is changing the conversation, making data access more readily available to all of us. And with that comes changes in how we look at talent. How many of you guys heard John's talk yesterday? Raise your hand. All right, so you know what I'm talking about. So the world is changing, technology is changing jobs, it's also opening up the conversation. So our mission at LinkedIn and HR is to help build a high performing healthy company to scale. Now I get a lot of pushback from Jeff, what does healthy mean, is that your benefit plan? Is this your 401k Pat, what's healthy? <laughs> and I said Jeff, no, healthy is about a company that is respectful, it's inclusive, people belong here. They can rock their unique selves. They perform their best. They smile in the hallway, right? They innovate. They refer their best buddies and those they don't even know that work with them into the fold of LinkedIn. That's a healthy company. Those are indi you know, indicators of a really healthy, dynamic organization. That's what I want to build for LinkedIn. So we created an employee value proposition when I first started at LinkedIn. We were a year and a half, two years out of IPO. We were still structured uh, HR, decentralized, very much scrappy uh, organization, but we were gonna become the choke point to LinkedIn success. We couldn't hire technology engineers fast enough. We had issues globally, compliance issues, I won't tell you where, because I don't know who's listening. And we fixed those, by the way. <laughs> but we had issues and opportunity. And so for, um, I pulled back and I said to my team, I said, look, we're less than a billion dollar company today. We need to be great. I don't want to wait till the company needs us. I want to jump in front of when LinkedIn needs us. I want to be the enabler of our great success. So let's imagine a world three, five years out. We're a $10 billion organization. Let's say we have 30,000 employees. I'm making all this up, of course. Let's say we have 75 countries, we're doing M&A with Grace, we're doing joint ventures, uh, we have an amazing talent brand, we are the destination around the world, our engagement is in the top one percentile, the list goes on. Now let's reverse engineer what that takes. Let's take that goal post and say if we want it in three years, four years, what do we have to do as HR professionals to make that a reality? And so we went on that quest. We got together for about, I don't know, we kicked it off in August, gave them the goalposts. They worked for three months. Each of the centers of excellence, my business partners, we talked to the business, what's the business problem we're trying to solve? I outlined the opportunity. What does that take? And we created by that fall this journey map. This is a three year roadmap. Not everything's written up here. I can give you our full journey map, I don't mind. But what it's meant to depict for you guys is that here's all the different functions that sit around my table. My organization's really flat in terms of my leadership team. I have six business partners, imagine this on one side of the room, supporting sales and product and engineering, GNA, the APAC region, and EMEA. And on this side of the table, I have my centers of excellence listening to the business with me to have a great debate. I disaggregated, this doesn't show it, Comp and benefits. I've run compensation, they gave me benefits. That's what happens. You babysit benefits. In today's marketplace, especially with the millennial generation, benefits, your employee experience is a differentiator, don't let it be babysat. 
I disaggregated it, created an employee experience team. And I'll tell you what innovation they've been doing. It's one of my stories. It's changed the mindset. How you onboard them, the facilities in which they work, how you treat them, where they are in their life cycle, uh, the alumni group we developed, that's the employee experience component. You see technology, you see ops. So I have on my centers of excellence, comp, experience, learning and development, which includes talent management. I have talent acquisition, I have HR ops and IT with the PMO office, and I have data analytics. So we have a great debate that happens on our table all the time. And this is our journey map to get to the vision of inspiring you to transform the world of talent. Because if we do things really well and take care of the hygiene, then we get to do some sexy stuff. So the first half of the 18 months that we were there and working together was about the platform play. You see it in the top left. I used this document with my leadership team and my board, and I said, kind of leave me alone. Let me fix the fundamentals. Let me be great and earn your trust. Let me get my data right. Let me implement Workday, the comp structure, how we pay, make sure I can retain and attract the right talent and afford it in the right meaningful way. You know, where's my data? So a lot of fundamental stuff was going on. I didn't want to innovate when we weren't ready. And after 18 months, we got to iterate and innovate. That's when the sexy stuff started happening. Now, mind you, we are almost complete in our three-year journey. We paused back in December and reflected on this journey map. We have achieved 97% of what's on that roadmap. We stayed on it. Every quarter, each year, we have a quarterly roadmap. What does it take to make this happen? What's behind the scenes? What's customer facing? Let's make sure we have you know, change management, training and development. You know, why are we doing this? What are the metrics? Why does it even matter? And if it doesn't matter, kill it. When we did our lynda.com acquisition last spring, that wasn't on my roadmap. I delayed some things to make sure that acquisition was done with grace. I leveraged the systems and tools we built in the platform to ensure that we had the right data sets to do it right. And it was compliant. So this really was helpful for me and my team to get our stuff together and to give us the freedom to innovate. So here's the first part, making HR sexy. Um, I sat down with the interns over a year ago and I said with my team, I'm struggling with our interns in HR. They're touching the elephant in different pieces. They're seeing HR as comp, so data analytics perhaps, some insights. They're looking at from recruiting end, they're looking at from business partner end, learning and development, whatever the case may be. But I don't see my interns actually discussing why they matter in the broader scheme. Why? Do they need to care what the other is doing? And so last summer, we decided as a leadership team in HR that we would donate 40, 50% of their time while at LinkedIn for the summer to host and design a, a non-tech hackathon. So our interns actually designed it. They self-managed it. I had four MBA students managing five undergrads each. They did the marketing materials. They had to work with marketing at LinkedIn. What does this look like? What's our trademark, our brand? Make sure we're on point. You know, how do you sign up? How do you enroll? How do you invite? What's the algorithm look like? They invited over 1,200 interns around the Bay Area to our hackathon. And we hosted on a Friday night to a Saturday afternoon. In a typical tech hackathon, if you were to invite that many people, you're lucky to have, on average, 100 engineers show up you get about 300 registering. We had 925 students register. Freaked us out. My interns weren't ready for that, and our fire codes weren't ready for that, and so we're like, all right, so let's really be selective, and we ended up inviting 200 to LinkedIn. And so we created this festival. They named it, they wanted a festival. It's the millennial language, I said I'm all in. I said pick a topic that's relevant to today's talent space. I want them to learn what is HR. I don't care what their discipline is. I want them to come in and hack their experience as a talent entity. What does it look like to be recruited? What does it look like as, an, as a college student looking up in the world? What's, what tools are available? How do you know where you're gonna pursue your career? What matters to these people? I wanna know. And so the team did research and they picked a theme. The theme was engagement. The number one topic written about online, on LinkedIn, on Huffington Post, is engagement, some form of employee engagement. The cost of it, when it goes awry, 
How do you get engagement? Performance management is part of engagement, the cost of low engagement, on and on and on. So they did their research. They got really excited about it and created a learning template for these interns. And so end of July is when we launched our festival. I want to do a hack for HR. It's not been done before. To educate me and each other, like to make connections, uh, to meet really cool people, and to solve problems, not create an app. It was a beautiful idea to tee this up as something about employee engagement, and particularly for people to reflect on what would engage me, what would engage people like me. What happens when you take an idea from an HR hackathon and apply it to 336,000 people in 120 countries? That's impact and that's scale and I'm really excited to hear what we're gonna do. You will make two significant companies take your ideas to market. There is prize money, but don't you want that on your profile? Don't you want to know you changed the world somehow? That's what I want. So far, it's about 2.30 a.m. and we're pretty tired. We're starting to kind of push the boundaries and think, where can we apply employee engagement um, outside the normal life cycle? There's a lot of very exceptional students here, anywhere from a biotech company to an advertising company. I have no technical backgrounds. I studied marketing, so this was a perfect opportunity to do my first ever hackathon, and I'm glad I did it. It's a great opportunity for different minds to come. Together. These are kids my age who just want to meet up somewhere at midnight and work on cool ideas. Yeah, DJ, food trucks, video game trucks, things I didn't even know existed. And that was all there in our parking lot and people were going wild, we were eating. This event exceeded all expectations. For something so groundbreaking, the fact that we've done something brand new, unleashed the creative power of all of these super amazing, intelligent young minds. The ideas that they came up with and all of the different avenues that we could possibly go down as an HR team now are just endless. First place winners are Infinity. It greatly exceeded our expectations. That was quite a day. <laughs>All right, so here's what happened. The students came in. There was a 50-50 mix in gender. Love seeing that. There was about 165, 170 actually showed up that day. There was only three or four students that actually were pursuing HR as a discipline. That's it. There were women that were in the STEM in schools such as Berkeley, Stanford, MIT, this is their first hackathon they ever wanted to go and ever attended, that they felt they belonged. These are engineers, these are incredible women that have not done this in the past and felt this is the first time they could do this. People love the idea of thinking about you know, themselves and their experiences and maybe they could change the world and learn something and have a great festival, a great party. You saw they had a great time. Um, and, the, and they created teams. They met individuals across the Bay Area they never knew before. So connections were made, knowledge was shared, the energy was amazing. I, I do believe this is the highlight of my career so far. They got together, they had about two hours to brainstorm what they were gonna tackle based on the prompts. We had coaches hovering around the area giving them insights, professional HR people going, this is how you look at it. They're on Google, they're on LinkedIn, they're on all kinds of data researches. We had a team actually launch a survey by 9 p.m. that night that went on till 6 a.m. the next morning to, to interview and to ask questions of over 700 interns around the United States and the world and got those responses, 700 overnight. What are these kids doing overnight? Answering surveys Friday night? <laughs> I don't know how they did it. Um, but these kids are creative. Very, very passionate, they were fun, they learned. They had preliminary judging. We had people, experts in data analytics, in engineering, in the sciences, in HR, sit and look at their prompt. They were trying to solve problems like, one of my favorites was this team called FOMO. Fear of missing out. I'm like, I have to love that. I learned what that acronym meant like two months earlier. I'm like, I know what that is. And I said, tell me what your product is. And their idea, and they had like five minutes speech, right? Give you the you know, business case they're trying to solve. And if, for the FOMO team, what they were trying to do 
is a feedback loop. Feedback is missing in today's workplace. Every team saw feedback loop as missing. Infinity saw it as missing for interns specifically and created it a way in which to gather it and they created an idea for an app. The FOMO team looked at it as an ongoing problem and said what if you had a clear prompt on an email, on your Outlook, on your Google Mail that said we just had a meeting in our calendar and I wanna give you feedback, George. And so I send you a note and George goes, oh, Pat gave me feedback and he launches my email and, and he cannot see my feedback until he gives me some in return. Because he's fearing missing out on what I said. He responds, Pat, thank you so much for joining my meeting. Here's what I thought we accomplished. I loved your data, you were prepared. Thank you so much, blah, 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 sign off. As soon as he sends that, he gets to open up my feedback. Now when we prompt the students about, you know, the quality of the feedback is as much as, you know, as urgent as the timeliness of it. So how do you not say that I like George's tie and he likes my shoes? Like, that's not really relevant in the workplace. What do you do for that? And so they came up with emojis. This says great quality feedback, I'm gonna do something with it. Eh, not so useful, not good at all, right? So it gives me a sense that you're actually in the game with me. And then you get rated as a feedback giver. I thought that was highly ingenious, right? Feedback should be a gift, it should be relevant and constructive. These students came up with some great ideas. Oh, I'm going backwards, sorry about that. So these are my panelists. You missed John Boudreau here. I had my VP of product design, Steve Johnson, looking at the UED, looking at the engineering, looking at how you are actually critically thinking. I had Leanne from Workday, runs the product for Workday from a human capital systems, their ecosystem. They touch so many lives in Workday. I went and heard here from these students. She was like, yeah, bring me in. Ellen Shook, head of HR for Accenture. Hundreds, you know, about 100,000 employees, something like that around the world that she touches in the global footprint in an amazing creative way. You have me, of course, and you had John Boudreau. This thought panelist came together, really excited to hear what these students had to say. It was phenomenal for us. We learned a lot. And Affinity earned $5,000. They also got jobs. So the gentleman on the left got a job with our economic graph team at LinkedIn. He had such creative ideas and he kept thinking about how to find information, why does it matter for people and talent. He's now pursuing insights and science around human behavior finding jobs around the world. This matters. It matters to this generation, it matters to me. We pulse these uh, students after, before and after the event. Your awareness of HR when you walked in today at 6 p.m., and now it's noon on Saturday. What do you think? Just curious. They were at a one or a two or a zero in the understanding of HR. By the end of the day, they were nine to 10 plus. Some people are like, oh my God, mind blowing. I'm gonna pursue HR as a career. That's cool. Because <laughs> remember, only three were HR geeks like me, right? You've got 160 some odd students now really seeing the magic of HR. Even if they don't pursue this discipline, their awareness of human capital, of, of the ecosystem, what makes engagement, of the power of feedback, of the network, that's the gift they got. My ideal dream is that my HR, HR business partners, if you will, are no longer as neat as they are today because our core skills and sensitivities and awareness of the human ecosystem is embedded in every leader around the world. That would be awesome, right? It's not happening yet, but I think it would be kind of cool. So they were excited. <laughs> These are quotes on that survey. They walked away with the appreciation of the human element in a, in a business world like never before. And I continue to engage with many of these students from that night with very thoughtful questions, pulling us into their career centers. So many universities around the United States only pull in the student at their senior year. This should be embedded in how they grow up in academia. You should have your onboarding orientation as a freshman and then you should see your career center. Like why in the hell am I taking this degree? What does this mean for me? Let me look up at my alumni. What are the skills needed? How do I get polished? How do I you know, find my joy and my purpose? Is this really what I want? 
these students now have that appreciation will be demanding more insights, which I think is phenomenal. As a mother of three millennials, I think this is awesome. All right, so that was really fun for me. On the hackathon idea, I'm gonna give you some creative thinking. We're gonna do a hackathon uh, with Accenture in India uh, next summer. We're gonna do it for the students, for the youth, to help them think through whatever they think is the most relevant topic there and see how it changes globally. I've had companies do hackathons internally on their culture. And it's internal hackathon cross-functionally to see what could they do better. And I was a judge at a couple of those, very insightful. Common themes, feedback, giving guidance from their manager and goals. Goals are not clear and or antiquated the minute they walked out of that office because something changed. The world is dynamic and the goals are not. So it's been a great, great journey for me to continue to discover how everyone in work thinks about the human element and gets engaged with it. So now, this choice thing. Everyone has a limited budget on benefits. Everyone has a limited budget on what they can spend for talent, the facilities, the cost of that talent, the tools we give you. It's, it's really hard to maintain competitive edge. And so within LinkedIn, I'm like, what is it? You know, I traveled around the world. I listened you know, to the LBGT team. I listened to women and their issues. We got uh, fertility benefits enrollment. We got a whole bunch of stuff going on in benefits and perks, but it wasn't enough. It was main, mainly parent friendly, family friendly kind of benefits, which is great. But if you think about 67% of my workforce are millennials under the age of 34, then maybe not all of them have families. So I wasn't meeting them where they are in their life cycle. And I was missing a huge engagement tool. And if you think about the human psychology and you think about the brain, you feel more ownership and more empowerment when you have choice. If I tell you you have three ways to go, and I outline three ways, you feel better engaged, you own your outcome, choice is a magical thing. So what if we went and did choice and benefits? So Nina McQueen, who runs my employee experience team, uh, Nina and I go way back. We worked together at Yahoo. She worked at The Gap. She worked at Facebook. I quartered her out of Facebook to join me again at LinkedIn. Highly creative in this space. She went around and said, I want to create a program that gives choice, gives everyone an allowance around the globe to do different things. Maybe it's a massage, dog walking, babysitting, car washing. I don't care. How do you do it? Is there a tool out there? Is there a program out there that already exists that I can leverage and bring it into LinkedIn? There's not a thing out there last year that could serve this. No one else was doing this. It was frustrating. It was an obvious need. She surveyed our employees. What do you need? We didn't get one answer, we got 10. And so how do you serve 10? We couldn't do it in a reasonable, physical, responsible way. So Nina said, let's do it ourselves. So she created Perka with her team. We piloted it in 2015. It's a perk allowance. It's reimbursable expenses. We told them what choices they had to get reimbursed. You can photo your expense on your iPhone and submit it through your iPhone, very easy. The back end is our workday expense tool, just a front end that we designed. It's personalized to you, it's $2,000 a quarter. Use it or lose it. It's a taxable benefit. Everyone's eligible. We have a cutoff. If you're not there in the beginning of the quarter, you, you wait to the next quarter. And you have a claiming process. So we rolled it out. This is what we found in our pilot. Fitness center membership was the top use case. Massage, second. I guess we're tight. Fitness classes, daycare, personal trainer, after school care, and day camp. It was fascinating to see from this experience that we had so many people asking for rock climbing. That's like, a, you know, fitness training. I want to do blank, add this as a perk, add that as a perk. I want acupuncture. Well, that's funny that you mentioned that. Acupuncture is really in our benefit program. Did you know this? I need this. Well, funny that you mentioned that. We already have that program. So it was a phenomenal education catalyst. We don't have to cover everything. It creates the catalyst for the conversation. And so we put perk up on coffee mugs, you know, on the paper, on the posters. We want you to smile. This is the, probably the most talked about benefit LinkedIn has to date. 
and it's very, very reasonable. These are comments from our employees. I love this picture. So for me, it's about exploring with the employee base. It's about meeting them where they are in their life cycle. It's about taking risks. It's seeing what worked and look at the data. It's taking that in and saying, what can we do differently with it while being responsible that operating expense of that 70%? What's the biggest bang? What are we going to add to it? You know, what do the employees really appreciate? I continually go in every office throughout the world and perk up as mentioned. Now, this has been in practice now for six, seven months. It's still being talked about. The beauty of this program is you can add and detract opportunities and keep it fresh and real for humans. You can adapt it locally and globally. Things that are normalized in India as an allowance, you can add something else. You have choice. And I think that's pretty cool, don't you? I do. Thank you. I like a little feedback. So let's bring sexy back. Let's make it creative. You can be responsible with it, but your employees will appreciate it. And I know I do. I know my family does. I know I've leveraged that perk. It's so cool. So try an experiment, create a hack, invite people in your doors, find out what they're thinking about. Listen to their language. The nomenclature is the language of the world. Don't speak in HR speak. What do they say? Eavesdrop, be a voyeur. <laughs> I've learned a lot from listening and then parroting back the same concept in their words, and they think it's a brilliant new idea. Then they buy it. My language was off. So let's bring sexy back. With that, I'll pause and answer any questions you guys may have. I hope this was helpful. Thank you. All right, any questions out there? Let's go there. I still, for a traditional company, I still think you have the, the benefit of a hack, right, in the manufacturing site. So I used to work for Applied Materials and Manufacturing. I actually support the manufacturing site. And if you can figure out ways to have them own and operate some creative ideas for employee celebrations, you can figure out what is within your domain to give them choice and allow them to hack their way about what does that experience look like within a reasonable budget. They have a lot of fun and engagement, and they own the outcome. So I would attempt many hacks on different problems you want to solve. It's very cost reasonable, pay and buy their lunch, you know, and you can just reallocate dollars, if you will, from other things. But I'd, I'd bring them into the decision making. At LinkedIn, for example, in the diversity inclusion aspect, we're talking a lot about belonging. And rather than me edict what does belonging look like and feel like in those belonging moments I'm trying to create within the company, I'm asking the ERGs for their feedback in crafting those questions. So I have over 1,000, 2,000 employees writing in to me about recommendations of those questions and how they would interpret those questions globally. And they're going to be you know, sh you know, shuffled through and figured out exactly how I'm going to phrase those questions. They're going to show up in the employee voice survey coming up in the next two months. And they're going to see their language, their questions in a survey. They're going to be highly engaged and motivated to answer. And I'll have a really amazing tool to measure diversity, inclusion, and belonging for the first time. So bringing my employees in is magic in any way you can figure it out. I think there was a question. Yes, ma'am. On the hackathon, I love it. Um, what is one thing that happened at the hackathon that you did not expect, that your teams did not expect? And then in doing it again and replicating it, what would you change or do differently? Great question. Um, I didn't expect, actually, 
I didn't expect the naked woman when I walked in the door. She was getting body painted. <laughs> That's a true story. And I was with my daughter. And I went, whoa, 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 put clouds on her. So one of the pictures you see a naked, blue-bodied woman with big clouds, that, I didn't expect that. Um, but besides that, that took me about an hour to go, wow, people are different. Um, really, it took me an hour. <laughs> my daughter was like, did you see that? I'm like, shh, don't talk about it. Um, for the hackathon itself, what I found amazing is the ignorance of the complexity of onboarding this talent, of giving them feedback real time. They got a really mature reality check about what does that look like. So we get teased about this generation about they get a ribbon just for participating. So they expect all this great feedback constantly in promotions and or what. And so when they were looking at the ecosystem of feedback, they realized that they have to participate in this. It's got to be reasonable. Um, it can't give away material information if you're working in sales, for example, where people can hack into core data. Like it's got to be protected in some way of their impact and feedback. And so they walked away very thoughtful and realizing they could do a better job giving feedback to those around them as well. So feedback really ended up resonating with most of these students. That was a gift. What I would do differently going forward is probably a um, little tighter on our prompt and education because only two or three people in that entire group of interns knew what HR was. So they spent a lot more on the front end about research when they could have been problem solving. So I think I, what I'll do is give a little bit more research in front of them and tell them where to find some stuff that they can go geek out on to shorten that development cycle. How do you control the alcohol consumption at these events with college students? <laughs> they didn't have any. Oh. All right, good. <laughs> they didn't have any. So we, we fed them a lot. We gave them Red Bull. Uh, so they were high on caffeine. I think that's it. And um, <laughs> you never know. Just be real. So I had my team, my staff, uh, my judges walking around. I was, a lot of my time was spent there in the evening till about 11 at night. Then I showed up at 6 the next morning. Uh, they were crashing, sleeping in sleeping bags. It was a lot of fun, but no alcohol. So I have a question. Um, I'm, I'm really intrigued by your presentation, so thank you for being so open in what you shared. In our organization, we have a lot of, I guess I would call it traditional HR functions. So when I'm thinking about your hackathon and you bringing in all this amazing talent that really doesn't have an HR background or wasn't really aware of what HR does, what are your thoughts now as you add to your HR team about the experiences or the background that you're looking for when you hire? Oh, I love that question. So we've developed a generalist role, like a talent services generalist role as a pipeline for the future of HR. And this generalist is a training ground. They can go into business partners, they can go into the program uh, change management office, they can go into comp, they can go into recruiting. Um, so it's a great pipeline. I also use um, that talent in recruiting because we use everything on LinkedIn for LinkedIn. And so bringing them in, we have a very robust training program about using data, how to look at talent, identifying talent, pulling it in, looking at a diverse slate. So again, I think it gives them a nice indicator and they don't have to have the traditional HR bent, right? They don't need the psychology background, et cetera. They can learn the business practicality of it. So I, I consider myself a business leader that happens to run the function of HR because HR is so freaking cool, right? I don't wanna let it go. I dropped out of HR twice to learn sales, IT, business process, and org change and keep coming back to the function because it's the most beautiful impact in any company. I wanna show that to people. Yes. Uh, we're hogging the limelight on the front table here, so. <laughs> this table's taking up all the questions, <laughs> just so you guys know. <laughs> um, I was fascinated with what you're saying about engagement and particularly the whole thing about belonging. Can you just say a bit more about what you're doing in terms of the belonging initiative? i love to. So um, bear with me while I tell a brief story. I spoke at an event last week in San Francisco called the Professional Business Women's uh, Conference. And it was about 5,000 women at the Moscone Center. And I was on a DNI panel. And they asked me to do like a TEDx type seven minute talk to introduce the panel. And it was about DNI. And in that conversation, uh, diversity and inclusion is necessary but not sufficient for me as a human being. 
and I struggle with it, and I care deeply about it, so I was struggling, why? How do I convey my passion about it? How do I capture minds and hearts? And in prep for this event, actually, I was thinking about belonging, belonging moments. I can tell you my first belonging moment. I was nine years old. I was a tomboy, short hair. My brother and I are 12 months apart, Irish twins, baby out of eight kids. And he was a pitcher in baseball, and therefore I'm his wingman. I was his catcher. I grew up catching. And, but I never tried out for baseball, I just followed his career. And so one time his friends thought it'd be a joke if I tried out with them, because you couldn't tell I was a girl yet, I guess. And I went and tried out. There's several hundred young boys, a lot of giggling going on with those that knew me. I got picked on a team in, in like the second round, very high selection as a catcher for the Pirates, until my sisters called me Patty. And then the coaches said, you can't play. And I ended up, you know, saying, ah, and they said, okay, you can play. And so I ended up playing. <laughs> and within like a week of practice, a, a, a teammate stole my catcher's mitt. I had a red catcher's mitt, and I'm a lefty. So it's a right-hand mitt. It's very expensive at the time. And I was so super bummed. And it was their way to saying, go away. And I refused, so I started using a, a righty's catcher's mitt, learned to catch with my left hand, take off the glove, and throw with my left hand. But it slowed me down until one day in a game five, I threw a kid out on second, and we won. And the team went crazy, and they invited me to pizza for the first time. Usually after the game, they went their way, and I waited for a ride. And so then the kid came back and said, Patty, here's your mitt. We like you on the team. And they invited me to pizza, and I never let go. And then I remember in working with a bunch of engineers, the first time after a year of working with these guys, they invited me to lunch for burgers and beer. And I'm like, I don't even want a burger, but I will eat it because this is so cool. They invited me to burgers. And we became fast friends. And so I want to teach the world these belonging moments because you can give them to each other. You can pause to listen to someone speak in a room. You can give credit where it's due. If a man speaks over a woman, which is data shows it happens quite frequently, unfortunately, or an extrovert over an introvert. You can say, I really love that idea, Tim, um, that you, you evolved from what Ellen was thinking. Ellen, where did you come up with that idea? That's fascinating. And you can give credit gracefully back where it's due without making anyone feel, because people don't know they're doing this. When an introvert tries to speak up and, and gets spoken over, you can say, pause, I, I want to hear what Kathy has to say. I think you want to say something. And then you have the grace and respect. So these are belonging moments. So in this prep, I was thinking, how do, I, how do I codify it so it's simple for you to understand and remember? And so I came up with dibs, diversity, inclusion, and belonging. So I'm calling dibs on diversity. Isn't that cool? I was like, this is awesome, dibs. And so then I'm like, is this real? Can I do like hashtag dibs? Like, what does dibs mean? Like, what's the definition of dibs? I know I called dibs for the front seat, but is dibs really real? And so I got a little team together in my office and like, look up dibs in the dictionary. And so we were like, ah. And so Google search dibs, Urban Dictionary, I fell in love. It's the most powerful force in the universe to call to oneself dibs. And I'm like, done. So I introduced dibs last week at PBWC. And so at LinkedIn, what we're going to be teaching, we were talking about acts of inclusion. I'm going to talk about belonging moments. Because the employees believe that diversity and inclusion is an executive ownership, not theirs. We all can do it. And so I'm going to be pushing belonging moments and dibs wherever I talk. So thank you for giving me that opportunity. Thank you. Other questions in the back, sir? You mentioned uh, disaggregating compensation and benefits. Yep. How did you organize and align your benefits teams so that they focused on global employee experience and not US medical cost and administration? Easy peasy. Uh, we put people across the globe. We have someone running, actually, we merge the roles in the regions at the, at the head level. So we have a comp and bend leader, an APAC comp and bend leader in EMEA. But underneath, you had employee experience and cultural owners in every location. And we have volunteers of employees owning the cultural activities that come together to do our end days, speaker series, the events that we host. And then we seed you know, a person or two in each region to make sure that they have the right resources, budget, marketing materials, et cetera. So it has a global feel, yet very localized. Because I think the local nuance, language, pictures, et cetera, need to feel real to them. So that's how we pivot. Great question. Yes, sir, in the back. 
Uh, good morning, wonderful stuff. Uh, Just a, a hypothetical question for you. Um, some of the questions you've heard here, I think represent the fact that we, some of us are in either older industries or companies where we think, yeah, this wouldn't be possible. I could never get stakeholders aligned around this. So I want to, I, I wonder if you could imagine being CHRO of the HR profession. So you get to look down on all these functions in all of these industries and companies. What would be the one or two things you would either wish for or encourage or say, we're taking the entire profession in this direction and this is what we'll base it on? Just hypothetically. Hypothetically. That would be my dream job. <laughs> Does that exist? Um, I think that what we should be able to do is look at the business and the marketplace in which you're competing. Look at the talent that you're hiring. Look at the footprint. I do an org health review with my te uh, executive team twice a year to just see what we look like. I call it holding the mirror up. And if something feels wrong, fix it. And so we try to figure out, because I don't want to chase the wrong rabbit. I want to make sure I'm not chasing a symptom but getting the root cause so it gets in my DNA. It's business-led, HR enabled all the time. And sometimes I'm sneaky in how I lead through change. So I work for Plantronics, a 50-year-old company, manufacturing hardware, right? Um, just right before I went to LinkedIn, completely different industry. And by the way, I've changed industry every job I've ever taken for this very reason to understand how humans and the ecosystem of talent works. And in Plantronics, I couldn't do half of this stuff right at first. They didn't trust. It was too much change for them. And their internship program is family and friends. It was not a real job as to get them a paycheck. It was filing. It was nothing real there. And I thought that was a shame. I also saw intact teams that had been together 15 years without a new hire. Now, I could know that innovation was stopping with those teams. I could tell you by the lack of conferences they were going, lack of innovation and product line, that we were stalling. So I gave them interns. I gave them people that are pursuing their PhDs. I funded in my department. I said, I want to experiment on an intern program. It's not your budget. You just have to give them a project, and I'll run the program for you. And I got some resistance, and I made sure for bigger teams, I gave them two or three. I had an algorithm I was looking at to make sure there was enough change in there. If you have 10 people and you only insert one person, they get drowned out really fast. They normalize. If you have two people in, out of 10, they can make an impact. You have three, you're done. Change will happen. So for groups of 15, I wanted at least one or two interns where I felt that innovation had to occur, brought them together. This program launched. They took a project. They had to report to the CEO and the executives what they were working on. They got to do a couple of conferences, visit our manufacturer, and come back with this team and bring more insights. These teams have never been the same. They're innovating more. The development life cycle decreased. The product roadmap increased in terms of pipelining. The engagement scores of those teams increased by over 10 points. And now they are self-sustaining this internship program, even though I left three or four years ago. They fund it now. They see the beauty in it. So sometimes I take the hit first to lead, to make it less scary for them. Sometimes they see it. But if I really believe in something, I'll experiment. So I experiment a lot in small cases to get the win, to get the business case, to get the business to see it. So I keep going at a problem in multiple angles until they, they believe. Does that help? So experiment. Look at the business. Know the marketplace. Know the talent you're trying to hire. Meet them where they are. Yes. Hi, I have a, more of a personal leadership question for you. Um, it sounds like you're incredibly in touch with people um, down at every level, but you also have a large organization and a broad scope. So I'm just curious to hear any strategies that you use to really keep you, um, I guess, at the right level and involved in the right things. Thank you for asking that one. I care so freaking much. I think that I use my team to help me porpoise down in the organization. When I travel, I'm at the service of that office, of that team, to tell me how much they need me. Uh, do brown bags one-on-ones. I meet with customers. I bring uh, parts of my team with me when I do my, you know, my meetings so they can observe and learn. I'm an introvert by nature. Uh, so when you invite me into your world, I'm so thankful that I give you my energy. And so I want to make sure that I'm listening carefully to everybody. That's the gift an introvert brings. And my team knows me very well, and I make sure they do, so they know how to invite me. 
Even at this conference, I have two extroverts helping me navigate, right? So conference in, in spare time can be overwhelming in an, in, for an introvert. So my team helps me do that. And my leadership team knows my values. And so they know when I go in and push on them, it's coming from a great spot. I'm here to help LinkedIn win and make a great environment, full stop. So let's do it together. And I think that bodes a lot of trust. Other questions? I got 40 seconds, <laughs> according to that. <laughs> or I'm over, <gasps> I'm over. All right, let's thank you, Pat. Let's have a big round of applause for Pat. <laughs>